Hey everybody, it's Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com. I'm a big fan of the WebQ Worker pattern. It's a great pattern that can use with different architectural styles such as microservices or modular monolith. It doesn't really matter. It has a lot of scaling benefits where you can move work into the background, as well as if you have a lot of workflows or business processes that are long running or you have reoccurring batch jobs. So here's the WebQ worker pattern in its simplest form. We have our client make a request to our HP API. This is the web portion. From there, what it's doing is that request is gonna need to do something, perform some type of action. So what it's doing, it's creating a message to represent that and placing that on our queue. At that point, our requests from our client to our HP API to our web portion, we're done. The third step of this is having a worker. It's the one consuming messages and pulling messages off our queue to perform whatever work was actually requested. This could be, my example, interacting with our database, making some type of state change. But there's some dogma that can come with this. Before I get into that, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. And that's it, really. And whether you're using a monolith or microservices, it doesn't matter, you can apply this. However, there are some implications and that's what this video is about. The first is when people start applying this pattern, they want to apply it everywhere. And that's really just not the case. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having your client reach out to your HTTP API and it interact with the database. Not everything has to be a message on the queue that the worker has to perform. It's just where it's appropriate. So it's not where everything has to be web queue worker. No, you can still have your HTTP API that has to get data out of a database that could be for query purposes. Even if it's an action, some type of command where it needs an immediate response. And that's the second issue people run into is that if you do have a legit use case where you're gonna put a message on a queue and the worker is gonna to need to execute that, how does it communicate that back meaningfully? So there's different ways to do this. I'll have a link at the very end of this video that kind of goes into more detail. But as an example, you could have your HP API, it's putting that message on the queue, our worker is gonna pick up that work, it's interacting with our database, making some type of state change. How does it communicate that back to the client? One way of doing this is through something like WebSockets. If you're in the .NET space and you're using like something like SignalR, ultimately you have some type of backplane, it could be Redis, which ultimately I'm not really illustrating here, but that's gonna be invoking something, telling your HP API that's hooked up, that has that WebSockets connection, to push that down to the client to communicate. And this is just a real issue and things that you need to overcome if you're doing background work. Another example I love to give is that it doesn't all necessarily have to be pushed to the client in that form and it could still be dealt with asynchronously. My example of this is if you did an online order and your credit card was declined and that credit card processing was done asynchronously, well, you're not gonna necessarily know in your browser, you might've closed your browser after you placed your order likely what you'll get is an email. It's still a form of notification, so it doesn't necessarily have to be dealt with all kind of in real time and pushed to the client. There's different ways of pushing that information, such as email. It just really depends on your context and what type of work you're performing and how or when the, the ultimate client or the end user needs to be notified of that work being successful or failing. Now, I also mentioned scaling in the WebQ worker pattern fits that bill because you're probably typically used to scaling out your HTTP API or your web portion that could be behind some type of load balancer and you're just scaling out. You're basically adding more instances that are available for requests. In doing so, you'll notice here that I also made my database larger because if you're having in more inbound requests, you're gonna likely increase load potentially on your database, so you might need to scale that up. The same thing goes for the worker. If your HP API is producing that many messages on your queue, you're gonna need to keep up to that. And you can do that by adding more instances of the worker. So again, I'll have a link to the, uh, another video at the end of this video that really talks about that, which really is the competing consumers pattern for having more work that you can perform uh, concurrently to scale. But this is why the benefit of WebQ worker is that likely though, when you scale one, you're gonna have to scale the other. And it's an important point to make about scaling is that oftentimes you're just moving the bottleneck. It's great that the WebQ pattern allows you to scale out, but just realize when you do so, you might just be moving the bottleneck. My example of how scaling out kind of our web HTTP API, but that may have the effect on the database, which I might not be able to scale out, but I have to scale up. Or I may, might need to have to scale out 
our workers because we're queuing more messages, but that might also affect the database. Maybe we have some other downstream services that I'm gonna be adding load to. So ultimately, you really just end up moving the bottleneck, but it's great that you have these options to scale out. Now, regardless if you have a monolith or whether you wanna do this within a microservice, the thing I really wanna point out here is your HTTP API and your worker while in my example here, they're separate deployable units, meaning that they could be a separate process from each other um, or a separate container. They could be the exact same instance, but as I was mentioning for deployment and scaling concerns, you could separate them. However, they can be the exact same code base. From a development view, it could be the exact same code base with when you build them, ultimately have two different entry points. Our HP API is built from the same code base, but it is using some top level web framework to accept HTTP requests. And the same thing with our worker, it can be built from the same underlying code, but just has that top level entry point that's consuming messages from our queue. So if you think about an HTTP request coming into your HTTP API, and then you just turn that into a message that you have something that handles and executes that message, whether it's being executed from your HTTP API or you would enqueue it and it to be executed by your worker, it's the same underlying code. Obviously this has trade-offs because if you're sharing that code, that means if you make some type of change, you need to deploy your HTTP APIs and your workers together. So it's monolithic in that sense, but that's not to say that you can't apply this just to an individual service and do this exact same thing. Another benefit of the worker is it can become a task scheduler. We've all dealt with systems where we have to either do batch jobs or we have long running processes that need to run. If you've integrated with any other external services, maybe you need to do something on some interval. It may not involve your queue, depending on what type of task scheduler library you're using. Maybe you use a database, maybe you use the existing queue, but the case may be where maybe daily you have to go reach out to some third party to invoke some requests, get some data, interact with your database. But the worker is a great way to do this work asynchronously and it can become a task scheduler. Now you might be saying, okay, well, this is just really a monolith. This can go many different ways that I'm not really illustrating. I urge you strongly to look at some of the other videos or look up the four plus one architectural view model. Cause I'll say it again for those in the back, I say it enough if you've already watched my videos, is that logical boundaries aren't physical boundaries. When we start figuring this out, all this conversation about microservices, monoliths, it, everything turns upside down and really start viewing really ultimately patterns and a combination of architectural patterns, whether it is uh, event-driven architecture, whether it be something like WebQ Worker, you're using ultimately a bunch of patterns that turn into the architecture for your system. Don't get caught in these silos of, oh, I have to do microservices and it's done this way. You're ultimately doing a combination of things. If you're using the WebQ worker pattern, let me know in the comments, tooling you're using, and probably more importantly, kind of the pain points you've experienced with it. And if you have more questions than that and you wanna chat with other software developers about topics like this and around software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.